how are you doing? I'm going to do a really short series of videos about the 12 bar blues. I'm going to do it as a series so the videos don't get too long. A quick series of short videos which could act as a guide to I suppose this is aimed at new guitar players, guitarists who are, have been playing a while but they've not had much experience of playing blues, and also, well, I suppose it might kind of interest more seasoned players as well. So this is episode one. I would like to talk about the 12 bar sequence, what it is, and how to play it on a guitar. Now this may seem really, really basic if you've been playing guitar for a while, however, there are a few interesting points. Over the past couple of years, I've played with a lot of really high quality musicians, and we're talking guys who are qualified, they've done like jazz degrees, or they've done full on music degrees. Oh, I suppose jazz degrees are pretty full on, but you know what I mean, like they're degree qualified or masters qualified musicians, really knowledgeable in music theory, able to improvise to a limited degree, the kinds of guys that do session work and get paid and earn a living out of playing music. So yeah, I'd broadly say what you'd call like serious professional musicians and I've had a ball playing with a lot of these guys however they don't know the 12 bar sequence and when I say no I mean really no know it so that you don't have to think about it anymore so that it's in you and there's no counting bars or anything like that it's just there in you. I think there are a lot of reasons why younger musicians today, and probably there are some that are, that are older as well, they don't have the grasp of this sequence that they should, and I think there are a few reasons behind that. One of them is the way people learn to play instruments nowadays has changed from the way that people learned years ago. So I think because of YouTube and because we're all exposed to like hyper-technical music all the time, we tend to run before we can walk and I think um, in the case of the 12 bar blues, people learn it, but they don't really learn it. And they, they think, oh, I've learned that now, and that's, that's enough. But that's not the same as knowing it inside out, back to front, feeling it in your soul when you're playing it. So I think that's one, one reason, is just because our, our learning is very accelerated nowadays. You can go from being a relative novice guitar player or bass player or whatever you are, and you can, you can sit down in front of Drumeo or some of the guitar tuition things, and in a year or two, you can be tapping and playing complex scales and all that information is out there. But learning those things in that way is not the same as spending years with them, which is what I've done. So the way that I grew up, I, I learned in an old fashioned way. There, there wasn't YouTube in those days. You know, you listen to records. I mean, my dad uh, taught me everything he knew. But I spent years going to blues jam nights and listening to blues and playing it. I played that sequence, I've played that sequence millions of times probably over the course of the last 28 years, which is how long I've been playing guitar. So it is in me and yeah, I guess what I'm, the point of this video is that there are a lot of great musicians that I play with who I think underestimate the sequence. And I think the problem with that is if you haven't spent enough time with this amazing sequence that we call 12 bar blues you might think that it's quite limited and there's not much you can do with it i mean most sort of intermediate guitar players if they hadn't played a 12 bar before maybe you could you could teach it to them in an hour and they think well that's that done then but it's not in the same way as like a 251 in jazz you can take a lifetime to learn to play over that sequence um, the 12 bar is exactly the same and it allows for unbelievable levels of improvisation and you, there are so many different ways that you can play it. It's one of the few sequences that resolves every time and needs no middle eight. It's, it's an amazing thing if you stop to think about what a 12 bar is. It doesn't need a middle eight. You can have a song of the same sequence and the way that it resolves every turnaround, every time you go from one sequence to another, it makes some kind of musical sense which means you don't need to do anything else with that song. Um, and, you know, indeed, we've got songs in our set which are just based around the 12 bar sequence and lots of people do that still because they recognise how flexible it is. I'm going to deal with soloing over a 12 bar sequence and phrasing. Yeah, this is something that I just think is being lost because, well, because I, mean, that, I didn't finish my earlier point really, the way that I grew up playing, going to these jam nights, interacting with these old guys who've been playing music for 50 years, you know, and getting on stage with them, you get something that you don't get out of a YouTube video or even a one-to-one -one guitar lesson with a guitar teacher. When you're jamming with guys on a stage who are better than you, you get to feel what that should feel like. I can remember doing a gig um, with, a, with a drummer who was in like my dad's band at the time. I must have been about 14 or 15. 
a guy called Die something, he used to play with a band called Snatch It Back. And he played a shuffle like it was the first time I'd played with a drummer who fucking knew how to play a shuffle. And it was magical. Once you feel that and you're playing with it in a band, it, it teaches you something that I don't think you can get anywhere else. And I think a lot of this is being lost. This is the end of my point. See, already this video is like seven minutes long. Well, okay, editing. A lot of this is being lost because a lot of you guys, if you're kind of like, if you've taken up guitar playing in the last 15 years, well, those jam nights and those guys, they're dying out. You know, you don't get the chance that I got to, to go and go to these places and jam with these wonderful people. The venues aren't doing the jams anymore. It's really hard. Some of you will know, if you check out my previous YouTube videos, that two years ago, just over two years ago, I spent three months in Austin because I wanted to go to one of the places where, you know, blues is the thing. There's no running away from, like, the quality of the guys who were there. And I really did find out, boy, did I find out how, what that quality was. So it was like going to ultimate, like, you know, ninja, Jedi level jam nights. But I fitted in immediately with these people. Like the drummers really enjoyed playing with me because I understood the rhythm work. Bass players, I fitted around their bass lines. I fitted in with, sometimes with, there'd be another guitar player, singer, so I knew how to play sympathetically to, to, to what they were doing and not get in their way. And you know, pretty much when you go to a, a blues jam night, it's definitely unsaid, sometimes it's actually said that, you know, stick to 12 bars because everyone knows where they are and everyone can enjoy themselves within that wonderful structure that, that 12 bar is. I mean, I think if somebody did some sort of mathematical analysis of a 12 bar sequence, there's like the golden ratio is in there somewhere because it's just so perfect and it still sounds so fresh. That's the overview of what this little series is gonna be about. Today, we're purely going to deal with what is a 12 bar blues and how do you play it on a guitar? Okay, so we're gonna do all these examples in the first part of this video in A. Okay, so I'm going to assume you know what a bar chord is, and I'm going to assume you you kind of know what this what this rhythm is. I suppose I'm assuming maybe a bit too much, but I'm sure there are other videos that you can go and see on how to play a racka racka, which is what I was I was always told it was called. But we're talking about this rhythm here. <laughs> Okay, so that's your basic kind of like mid pace 12 bar shuffle swing kind of blues rhythm. In a 12 bar sequence, there are basically three chords that you need to know. There is the first chord or the root chord, which in this case is A. There is uh, the fourth, which is D. And there is the fifth, which is E. And there is a sequence, and the sequence is made out of 12 bars. And these chords aren't really major or minor. And that's one of the other beautiful things about the 12 bar. Technically, you could say they're sevenths or whatever, but really, you're just playing sort of truncated bar chords, which are the first three notes of the chord. I suppose that's a sixth, is it? Or is it a seventh? Yeah, I suppose it goes up to a sixth, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm not going to get too in, entrenched in, in what the chords are. It doesn't really make any difference. I've played with like 80 year old blues guys who don't know what the chords are, but they, they know how to play the sequence. Um, in a traditional 12 bar sequence, you've basically got four bars spent on the root note. One, two, three, four. So that's your four bars on the root note. And then after that, You've got two bars on the fourth, which in this case is D. One, two, okay? And then you go back to the root note for two bars. One, two. So then we have one bar on the fifth, which is E. One, one bar on the D, which is the fourth. One, and then we have in theory, two bars on the root note. Okay? Now what usually happens at the end of a 12 bar sequence is there is a turnaround put in so that a cadence can happen to get you back into the root note of the next sequence. So that usually ends up with a half a bar or something on the, on the fifth. <laughs> and you're back off and running into the next sequence again. Now, there are licks that you can play at the end of a 12 bar sequence to get you into that, like bass lines. Or, 
however you want to play it. You could, that chord can be substituted with other chords, but that's more advanced and I don't think we'll get into it at this point. So, that is the sequence and I will play that sequence through once for you now. <laughs> Okay, so that is one full sequence of a 12 bar blues. Now, in order to get that in you, you need to play that over and over and over again. I mean, it's actually quite a physically demanding thing to play. If you, you know, it, has a, it has a stretch in it, it's, it's repetitive, your hand stays in the same position for quite a long time. You need to consider your hand position in this. I know my father, for example, he got carpal tunnel syndrome through playing and being a rhythm guitar player, player in a rock and roll band for years. And I mean, it really created problems in his wrist and he ended up having to have carpal tunnel surgery and then take great care of a playing the guitar. Also tendonitis would be a consideration. I mean, I don't think there are many guitar players who do this anymore, but there used to be rhythm guitar players who play 12 bar blues, you know, for a whole set, like 90 minutes, you'd be playing the same rhythm in various different guises. You know, I know like in my dad's old band was a rock and roll band, um, so that would, would have sounded more straight beat and rock and roll. <laughs> It's physically demanding to play. I mean, you might find it easy to play a 12 bar sequence, but try and play like 12 12 bar sequences, you know, and keep in time, your hands being in control. That's, that's physically demanding. And that's the kind of practice that you need to do to get this sequence into your mind, into your heart, so that you don't have to think about it anymore. You just feel it. Because when you come to solo over this, that's what you need. You, you can't be counting bars or getting confused. And, I know that there are people screaming at the screen at the moment saying, well, this is really easy, but it's obviously not really easy, is it? Because I've played with loads of first-class musicians who get it wrong. Highly qualified, highly technical musicians who I'm playing on stage with them and they make a change and I'm like, you changed two bars too early. And you talk to them about it afterwards and they're like, no, I didn't. They did, you know, because they haven't spent that much time with this sequence. And I think this sequence... Oh, okay, you can argue that the people that are in that situation have spent a lot of time learning other things, and that's fine. I completely accept that point. But if you're going to play a 12 bar, don't just think that it's like easy. It's not. To get to the point where you can feel it, it really isn't. And I would argue that feeling these changes when you've played something for, I don't know, tens or hundreds of hours, helps your songwriting because you really get an acute understanding of what that change sounds like. And how other changes sound, what intervals are doing when, when they're placed next to each other. So it has lots of benefits. It's definitely the most important thing I've ever learned. Okay, so now you've got, uh, hopefully, um, what the sequence is. We're not gonna check, we're not gonna throw in any funny stuff here, but we're gonna talk about, like this is the art of the rhythm work of playing a 12 bar sequence. So if I hear a guitar player playing a 12 bar rhythm and they're kind of like intermediate or they're a novice. I hate those terms because people generally are like good at one thing and not so good at another. So it's difficult to put pigeonhole people like that, but I've got to use them because I can't think of another way of, of saying um, that they're not sort of like advanced with this, this sort of thing. But generally I sort of hear guitar players playing that rhythm line and it's not tight. And I think the same thing goes for bass players and drummers as well, actually. I mean, that is a, I think that this basically is a triplet rhythm with certain triplets removed. That's what creates that. So it's just basically got like a triplet taken out of that groove, that 16th note groove, I think. <laughs> I'm not very good at this sort of thing. I'd have to go back and study. Um, but basically that's what it is. Now, in my mind, the way that I see this is you've got a straight groove, right? It's like, so let's just say it's a rock and roll groove. So there's no shuffle happening here. <laughs> Okay, so I just realized that I didn't record the amp on the first part of this video. So I'm hoping that whatever the camera's picking up is gonna be good enough for up until this point, but now you're gonna hear proper, <laughs> proper guitar sounds. Uh, so sorry about that. Yeah, so going back to my thing, let's just imagine we've got like a straight beat sort of rock and roll. Group. 
And if you've got then a shuffle, which is, let's just say this is really shuffly, you know. What you've actually got there is you've got a straight beat, and then you've got this sort of like syncopated kind of shuffly 16th beat. Well, you can go between those two things to make something shuffle more or shuffle less, and that's about how far you can press those notes together or how far you push them apart. <laughs> straight beat and then there's a shuffle beat and there's anything in between the two. Now sometimes I hear inexperienced musicians playing this. That's not very effective as a shuffle really and there are a lot of reasons for that. To my ear shuffles sound better when the gap between those triplet notes is pushed further. So I kind of want the two notes that are close together, bam, ba bam, ba bam, ba bam, ba bam, to be really squeezed together and have a big gap because that makes the shuffle more dramatic. If you listen to Stevie Ray play a shuffle, there's that, that song he plays on the 12 string. <laughs> And it's so effective, it just grooves, immediately it just grooves. And this is one of the hallmarks to me of a great shuffle. And when you hear a band groove that together in time, perfectly, in the pocket, oh, it's just, it's just incredible. It, it does something to audiences. It's just, it's actually, it's, it's an astonishing phenomenon. So that's one thing I think I want you to, to concentrate on when you're playing your rhythm work, is to get that dramatic sound. And what I described earlier on with the timing of what you're playing is really important, but what's also really important is muting and not allowing the notes to ring. So if I play that unmuted, but I'm still making it dramatic. It's kind of getting there, but it's not really getting there, is it? It's, it sounds, I don't know, there's no drama in that to me. There's nothing tight about it. And, for a shuffle to be effective, I think there are loose shuffles, but they're still played in a tight way. It's percussive and it's staccato. And furthermore, when it is tight, you can add drama by putting looser sections into it or putting more sustaining sections into it. So for a start off, playing a, a 12 bar, you know, racker racker shuffle on an electric guitar tight, it's a two-handed affair. So you're muting with this hand. <laughs> one thing but even that is quite limited. I think what's really useful is actually lifting these fingers just you're not lifting them off the strings but just lifting them off the frets. It's this dynamic in muting between your left and your right hand which really creates a, a tight shuffle guitar part and actually if you listen to people like Dave Edmonds yeah, some of those great old rock and roll guys, I mean, you know, Chuck Berry, they, they all understood this because it's, it's just tight, it's perfectly tight. So if you actually watch my left hand, yeah, there's a bit of muting going on here, but this is happening as well. things like making it more sustaining towards the end of a sequence to create that drama to go into that fifth chord. You know. you know, and if you wanted to take that a stage further. That's the drama of the turnaround. That's why, well, one of the reasons why the turnaround works. Because experienced blues musicians will push that turnaround there you know, maybe using techniques like sustain, playing a run, playing a run that's, that's not perfectly in time or something like that, but then going back to that watertight shuffle groove upon the, you know, the beginning of the next sequence. 
And that's the drama, that's, that's the resolution. Back, here we go again, and it just works. I don't know why it works, but that's definitely one of the reasons why it works. Um, if you want to go and check out some songs uh, that, that kind of show how well this works, um, it's not an exact 12 bar, but Robin Me Blind by Jimmy Vaughan on the um, Have You Got The Blues record is a perfect example. If you listen to what the bass, drums and rhythm guitar are playing on that song, they play the same thing every 12 bar sequence and yet somehow the song lifts every time they do it. And actually what the reality is, the song isn't, the, the song isn't lifting with every new sequence because it would be impossible to do that. But it's lifting towards the end of the, of, of the sequence and then it's dropping again and resetting at the beginning of the next sequence and then the whole thing lifts again toward the, towards the end of the 12 bar sequence. And this is relevant in, you know, Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac, exactly the same. Well, basically every great blues 12 bar sequence that you've heard, it, 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 does, it does that to some degree. And it happens in the soloing, the whole band makes that happen. The drummer just laying in a little bit tighter or harder. These are the things. So I think Whatever your technique for doing this is, see, I mean, I'm not muting that now with my right hand. That, that's no muting at all for my right hand or my palm or anything. That's all happening with my left hand. So um, maybe those sort of substitutions and things are, are for another lesson, another video. I don't want to call this a lesson. So there was one further thing that I wanted to mention. And again, I think because people aren't going to jam nights and they're not talking to other musicians about these things as they perhaps they must, they're used to, this knowledge isn't passed on. But and the, uh, So there is something in a 12 bar called a quick change and that means you do one bar on the root and you do one bar following that on the fourth and then you go back to the root note for the remaining two bars. So basically what you've done is at the start of a sequence you'd normally have four bars on the root note. Well you've substitute root note on the second bar for the fourth. So you just prematurely make that change. Now I know that this knowledge isn't being passed on because what we used to say when we'd be in a blues jam night was, it's a 12 bar in F with a quick change. And people would just understand what that meant. And this is what this sounds like in A. <laughs> So you can hopefully hear that quick change happen on bar number two. But the sequence, the rest of the sequence remains unchanged. So that is called a quick change. If somebody says to you, we're going to do a 12 bar and this is it's a quick change, that's the change. You know, there are also um, stops. 12 bar stops. So let's just go from the previous 12 bar sequence. So again, you're at a blues jam night and they say, oh yeah, I'll give you a nod when the stops happen. So here's the end of the previous 12 bar. <laughs> that a little bit but you know that's you know the stops would happen on that root note um, generally over the same four bars um, but again you would feel it so a song like Tour Down for example which is like a jam night staple you know everyone knows that song well there are verses where the stops just um, they're just I think the length of the normal uh, 12 bar sequence so um, well I, well I went to the river to jump in My baby showed up and said I will tell you where I'm going out Oh, oh, so with the ground Ok, 
Okay, so that was like a standard length stop there, wasn't it? Those stops just replaced the first four bars, I think. I'm hoping they did. Um, but they were like the short stops. Now, there are long stops also. There are other verses in that song where the stops take twice as, twice as long. So, um... Uh, I love you, baby, with all my might. Love like mine is up out of sight. I love you in the morning and it gets even too bad. You can hear those stops were twice as long. <coughs> I haven't sung for a while. Those stops were twice as long on the root note as the first version. Now, at a jam night, a blues jam night, you'd feel that. You would feel that from the phrasing of the vocals. Even if you haven't played that song before, the whole band, if they're experienced musicians, they know the sequence well enough to know, they, they even know what most people would play or to lead them into a change. So these are the kinds of levels that you get to. You're able to predict what's happening next. I kind of always know when I'm playing somebody with, like, I'm quite, I've, I've been to blues jams where I've led that song, or I've sung and played that song, and there'll be, like, maybe five guys in the band, and two of them don't know that track for whatever reason, which is kind of an, unbelievable, really, but there are millions of blues tracks. But you'll spot the one who knows what he's doing because he'll just know that stop is, is going to carry on for a bit longer. He'll, he's heard that, those kinds of vocals, he's heard the, that expression, and he knows, oh, there's more stops happening here, you know, without even thinking about it, people just know. And that's because they've played this sequence thousands and thousands of times. And I, I can't say that enough. You just need to play over it as much as you can, every day, listen to 12 Bar Blues, and you get to appreciate it in a, in a whole new way. So, right, this video has already been too long. The next, um, the next video I'm gonna do, I think, will be how to play different kinds of rhythm work. So I think what we're gonna look at in the next one is let's imagine you've got a band where you don't need to provide that level of rhythm. Um, like you've either got like a, a bass player and a pianist or a bass player and another guitar player or just a really strong bass player or you want to have a more stripped down sound. We'll take a look at like incidental guitar playing over a 12 bar sequence. All of this is going to be kind of, I'm just going to make it up as I go along. And I'm kind of, I like this mid paced 12 bar shuffle thing to, to teach or not to teach, but to uh, to explain these ideas over. So I'll probably keep it like with a similar kind of like mid-paced shuffle thing. But yeah, we'll look at some incidental chords and how to approach uh, other kinds of rhythm work over this. And maybe we'll look at some substitutions and things you can play into and out of changes, the way of dealing with the, the, the cadence at the end. Yeah, but so this is going to be a series. I'm hoping this video hasn't been too long. Thank you very much for checking it out. I apologise if you knew all these things already and have all of that experience. Um, but I think there are a lot of people out there. And if you have got that level of experience, I am absolutely sure that you've played with the kinds of people that I'm talking about who just need to spend more time with this sequence. One of the proudest moments of my life was when I was sitting in with a band in Austin and after the gig, the drummer came up to me and said, it's just a pleasure to play drums with you um, because your rhythm work is so tight and so strong. And that meant, I think that meant more to me, actually, than when people come up and say, oh my God, your soloing is amazing. That was like, that guy gets it. And all that, all those years of playing that, he understood that and that meant something, you know? So if you want to get better at this, understanding the, t the magic of the 12 bar sequence, Please check back to see the next videos in this series. I think there's going to be maybe three or four or maybe 5,000 videos <laughs> in this series. Uh, yeah, as usual, thank you very much for watching. If you like the channel, please subscribe. I'm nearly at 200 subscribers. I'm really trying to build this channel now. Give the video a thumbs up and take it easy. See you guys soon. Thank you.